Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The Other American Revolution, The Rise of Horse Cultures in the American West and the Transformation of Native America. We're joined tonight by lead scholar Elliot West of the University of Arkansas. My name is Andy Mink. I am the Vice President of Education for the National Humanities Center. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. I know uh, all of our worlds are sideways right now. Um, you likely are missing the faces of your students and the four walls of your classroom in ways that, that maybe you didn't realize uh, even after summer break and, and other extended vacations. Um, we really do appreciate you taking the time to spend with us. We hope that uh, tonight's conversation and the resources that Dr. West will share will be helpful in your teaching, in your classroom when things are back to normal, but maybe also in this online environment that we're suddenly all finding ourselves. I also know that we're all a little bit leery and weary of the Zoom uh, optics. We're constantly on these machines now and interact with each other in this way. Um, but personally, I find it to be a little refreshing to uh, take a break from the news and take a break from uh, the coronavirus to have a discussion like the one we will tonight. As always, I'd like to thank uh, my team, Libby Taylor and Mike Williams, for their help in uh, the good work we do at the center. Uh, both Libby and Mike are working remotely, as all of us are, uh, to keep the webinar series and the online courses um, moving forward and, and as helpful and relevant as hopefully they are. The center's been closed for about a month. Uh, we will remain closed uh, for business until the end of May at the minimum. Um, we have restructured and adjusted our summer programming uh, in the hopes that we can invite many of the teachers and the scholars we work with to Durham uh, starting in maybe in July. Um, but if you can't get to us physically, you can definitely get to us uh, through our website. The link is at the bottom of the page there, and I would encourage you to go and check this out as a place to get content resources, both instructional and uh, scholarly. Um, I'd also encourage you to sign up for our email list. I suspect many of you already are since you're getting our emails, you're in our webinars, but that doesn't always translate. And it's really helpful to hear um, new opportunities and to hear an update on the work that we're doing uh, through our email list, our constant contact blast. We don't send many emails out, but when they do, they're almost always um, in preparation of some new opportunity that we're offering. One thing that you can find on that website is a searchable index of all the content that we have at the center. That includes what, uh, for at least the last three or four years, has been the most accessed and downloaded uh, resource on our entire education platform. That's an essay uh, written by Clara Sue Kidwell at UNC Chapel Hill titled The Effects of Removal on American Indian Tribes. So if after tonight and uh, Dr. West's uh, talk, if there are different uh, materials that you think might be helpful in your classroom, including uh, including one like this, um, please do go and search that and you can get these free and open resources. It could be though that you listen to tonight's webinar, you participate and you decide to type in uh, something else about Native Americans and if so you might get the recording for uh, a webinar we did just last week with Phil Deloria from Harvard University uh, titled American Indians in the American Cultural Imagination. You can access a recording of this webinar if you didn't attend it live. You'll also be able to get access to the materials and the PowerPoint that uh, that Phil put together uh, very soon. Uh, you do that by going to our registration page and the register here button will have been changed and toggled to view recording. And that will take you to our archive of webinar recordings. Uh, tonight's session will be recorded as well. It will be posted usually within two days or so. Um, and these recordings might be something that you go back and linger with or you spend some time uh, going through some of the more complicated things we talked about, or it may be a place to start to edit it a little bit, uh, cut out some sections, and let your students listen to them, either as um, information that they uh, learn about and consume before some kind of formative assessment online, or maybe it's something they do in response as a prompt. Uh, but oftentimes our sessions, while they're not geared for students, are good ways to ex expose your students to this scholarly conversation. Or it could be that you go to our website and you search uh, disease or epidemic. Certainly two, uh, two things that are gonna come up tonight. And then you'll find a recording of Mary Wabel's uh, recent webinar with us on putting coronavirus in context. She did that, by the way, way back on March the 4th. But things have changed so much in just the last month or so, it seems like. A Couple other quick announcements. Uh, I'd like to remind you that we are currently accepting applications for the Teacher Advisory Council. Um, the tenure begins in August and it runs for a year and that does include a 
a fully funded trip to North Carolina to spend two days with us at the National Humanities Center. As a part of that application, we do ask you to get a letter of reference from your administrator or supervisor. And to be honest with you, what that really is intended to do is to have them acknowledge that you're gonna be out of school in October for a couple of days. And that way, when you go back to them and you ask for a sub and you ask for their, uh, their blessing that they've already signed off on it. So this is our way of getting your administration involved early so that when you come and join us, uh, you'll be able to, to do so without a whole lot of um, pushback. I also wanna remind you of our online courses. We are opening our next series of courses on May the 26th, which means registration is open currently. These courses are somewhere around five hours of work per week, which means you earn about 35 hours in total. Uh, these courses have been pre-approved in many of the states that all of you reside in, including Los Angeles Unified, which I know is not a state, but it's sometimes larger than some of the other states. Um, I also want to mention that we have changed the dates of our five-day institute with A.D. Carson titled Beyond February, Hip Hop and the African American Experience uh, that's now being offered at the end of July in anticipation of our lives being somewhat back to normal. Um, right now we have two spots left, but that those uh, reserve spaces do include a series of scholarships that we've been able to secure for teachers from different areas. That does include a scholarship specifically and explicitly for an educator in Los Angeles Unified District. So if you're in LAUSD, please do consider applying and you'll get a full ride to come and spend five days with us uh, this summer. While you'll only hear our voices tonight, we will be in conversation and that'll happen through the chat box. Uh, please use that chat box to not only introduce yourself and share with us your location, uh, but also uh, use that as a place to answer questions that LA may pose or ask for some clarifying comments or um, maybe you'll even have your own questions that you can share. But I'd also encourage you to talk to each other. Um, it's really refreshing, actually. It's rewarding to see already many of you are talking literally across the country. You're having conversations, you're making connections, you're uh, joining a network that we hope to continue to support. Tonight, I'm uh, extremely pleased to welcome Elliot West to the microphone. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with Elliot for about 15 years in a variety of um, in a variety of roles, including uh, both of us serving on the National Council for History Education Board of Directors. Um, and I know that uh, in some ways what Elliot's gonna do tonight is challenge uh, some narratives and uh, force us to, in some ways, rethink uh, some of the stories that we tell in American history that are very, very common, very, very uh, familiar, very, very um, secure. And I think when this happens, um, it's going to actually blossom that out and, and show how inclusive these these two parallel narratives might be. Elliot, you're down uh, somewhere in Arkansas. Can you hear me? I can indeed. How are you, Andy? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for joining, Elliot. Um, I'm going to give you the mouse in a moment and invite you to lead this conversation. But before we do, I'd, I'd actually like to start with a question of my own, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've got folks in the room tonight, educators from all over the country. All right. Um, I'm a native Virginian. I have always lived on the East Coast. I, I have very much of an East Coast perspective, I think, of uh, geography and landscape. Um, on the other hand, you know, as I move uh, to my to my left, looking at a map, you know, Jacqueline, who's in the room tonight, lives in Ohio. Uh, Jeremiah Snyder lives in Colorado Springs. Ginger Park lives in uh, Fort Collins. And then we get all the way out to the to the West Coast, and we've got uh, Brandy and Hugo and Janet and Raina and these folks in Southern California. So my question for you is, um, Elliot, what exactly is the West? I mean, when I think of the West, it's everything over there. But what, how do we actually define that in terms of concept and conceit? What, what does that mean? If I'm, if I'm Jacqueline in Ohio, am I in the West? It doesn't feel like she is, but where does it begin? It's a great question. It's one that uh, historians have uh, always argued about ever since they've paid any attention at all to Western history, uh, still argue about it, and I think we'll always be arguing about it. Um, you can think of the West in a couple of basic ways. The West as frontier, that is the idea of the West as a moving line. The West is that Western edge of settlement as it moves from the Atlantic coast gradually inward uh, into the uh, interior of North America. Uh, that's not the way that I'll be talking about it tonight. Uh, that's not the way that most uh, Western historians think of it now. They think of the West uh, as a place, a definable part of 
uh, North America. Uh, but that, of course, begs the question, what, what space? Where does it start? Where does it end? Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, I'll tell you a story. In fact, it's connected with North Carolina. When I first uh, took this uh, job at, um, at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Arkansas, I uh, went to a, a reception early on and I uh, uh, met uh, the wife of uh, one of my colleagues, a uh, person who became a very close friend later. Uh, she was from North Carolina uh, and she had this wonderful North Carolina accent, talk like that. Uh, and I said, uh, she said, what's your feel, Elliot? Uh, I said, uh, it's uh, Western history, the American West. And she said, oh, said, Will and I just love living in the West. I said, oh, I said, uh, when did you live there? And she said, well, why now? <laughs> so she was thinking about Fayetteville, Arkansas as the West. It is not the West. I'll say it right now. <laughs> Where it is, it's sort of a moving target. Uh, I think of the West as the area roughly beyond, that is to the left on a map, to the left of, west of, um, think of the Missouri River Valley, River Valley or, or think of roughly the 98th to the 100th meridian. Uh, where the land changes dramatically, a lot of the Great Plains, uh, where rainfall drops uh, dramatically uh, to under 20 inches per year. Much, most of the West is, is semi-arid, uh, where the land is, has, as one writer put it, uh, has no, uh, the eastern part of America, he said, has no hint of the western part. It's, it's, you know, it's flatter, it's rolling plains, it's, it's magnificent mountains. So that's what I think of it. I, I define it, I think of it defined basically geographically. Uh, and out of that, from the history, uh, shaped by that geography, uh, defined culturally and historically. That's fantastic. Thank you for, for giving us that sort of um, mental model as we engage in tonight's conversation. I'm curious, just as a quick follow up, where do you place the continental divide in that definition? Um, that's a physical uh, distinction, right? If you're literally on the continental divide, the water flows east one one side and west the other? Um, yeah. or, or are you thinking in much more of a sort of this emotional, psychological, historical view? I think it's, I think it's geographical, but it's also uh, emotional, psychological. It's mythical, it's mythic, the way we think of it uh, in terms of the, the mythic, but the sort of thing that Phil DeLoria talked about, um, talked about uh, last week. The Continental Divide, I would put uh, pretty much right in the middle of it. As I say, <laughs> the West is, uh, the West is at sort of basically the left-hand side of the, of the uh, of the 48 contiguous states. If you take, yeah. take a map of the 48 states and you sort of slice it down the middle, I think of the West as the left-hand side of it, which makes the West, of course, as a region, if we accept it as a region, it makes it far and away the largest region in the United States. And I think um, far and away the most diverse, um, diverse uh, geographically, and also incidentally uh, in human terms. We think of the East Coast as the great melting pot, but the West, but the American West, uh, from the very beginning, and certainly, and it's true today, is the most ethnically diverse part of the United States today. Yeah, to, to me, again, from an East Coast perspective, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, Jeremiah Snyder, who's again in Colorado Springs, notes that Frederick Jackson Turner once wrote in 1893 that the West was closed although nobody quite knows what he means by that. Um, so I, I'm gonna invite our audience tonight because many of them are on the left-hand side of the map to really maybe consider it from that, um, that self-reflective view as well. So I'm anxious to hear how you'll unpack this narrative for us. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, and thank you for the National Humanities Center for this invitation. As Andy said, uh, he and I have known each other quite a while. It goes back uh, 15 years, did you say, Andy? I think so. Yeah, about that. Um, quite, quite a while. We've worked, we worked together on teaching American history grants. We've worked together in the uh, uh, NCHE, the National Council for History Education. Uh, it's been a, a very happy relationship for myself, and I, and I appreciate the invitation to, uh, to take part here. I want to thank all of you. Welcome, all of you. And thank you for uh, taking part in this. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next um, hour and a bit more. Uh, and I also hope you're all well and safe at this very, very, very strange time. Uh, and so if you're anything like I am, you're uh, you're learning, getting to know your family even better than you thought that you know them before, as you're sort of uh, uh, cooped up here in this um, splitted isolation of our of our homes. Uh, let me begin by saying, sort of kind of following up actually on what Andy, uh, Andy's question and our discussion, um, 
saying that um, if I have a kind of a professional hobby horse, that is something a, something I pursue more than anything else, um, it would be this, uh, to suggest to the American people generally, and suggest especially to teachers of our students, uh, that we need to allow the American West much more than we have into the, into the national narrative. I think we cannot possibly begin to fully understand uh, the breadth and the scope of American history uh, until we begin letting the West into that story more fully. Something more than this sort of exotic uh, sideline to American history. It's really uh, quite central to it. And I would say the same thing about the history of Native American peoples. Uh, we cannot possibly begin to understand the full uh, scope of American history unless we get Indian peoples uh, into it. So the presentation tonight really is is uh, is, uh, is made in, in the hopes of trying to uh, suggest to you how American history can how our perception our understanding of uh, this larger story of American history can uh, can change can expand once we widen our lens pull back to pull back to a of a wider perspective that allows uh, that allows the full continental history of the country uh, into our narrative. And that allows also, uh, in particular, the um, uh, the role of American Indian peoples in that narrative. And to make that point, I'm, as you can see on the title here, I'm, I'm using the idea of uh, the other American Revolution, suggesting to you that there were really two great American revolutions that were happening, as it happened, as it turned out, uh, really kind of almost simultaneously, in parallel. One of them, the one that were most familiar with, of course, uh, involves leaders like this and like this. It involves uh, episodes and events like this. Emmanuel Loitz is a famous painting of, uh, of Washington crossing the Delaware. It involves documents like this. But this revolution, happened not on the Atlantic coast, not in that area uh, from the Atlantic coast over into the Appalachians, across the Appalachians. This revolution took place in the middle of the continent, in the middle of what's today of the United States. This uh, revolution, this revolution uh, included leaders like this, like this, it included episodes like this. And it included documents. We can approach it through documents like this. This is the winter count. You all might be familiar with this. This is a, this, this is basically a Native American history book uh, made on a, uh, a bison hide. Uh, each of those little pictographs, each of those little uh, pictures uh, represents the most important thing from the point of view of this particular Plains group. Uh, from their point of view, the most important event that occurred in that particular year, if you start in the center of this, uh, the, of this spiral and uh, work outward, spin outward, you can see it goes year by year by year. It's a history book. Yeah. And the story that I'm about to tell you uh, this evening uh, is uh, recorded. Part of it is at least is recorded in history books, history books like this. Uh, Elliot, can I ask just a quick uh, question? Jamie Beck uh, asks for you to repeat, please, the bison hide. What's that called again? It, these are called winter counts. Uh, each of those, each of those little pictures is a, it's called a winter count, singular. Uh, that's because it's taken from the Lakota, the Western Sioux uh, language. Uh, winter. In the uh, in the Lakota language, was a, was a, uh, meant the same thing as a year. So a winter count was the uh, little, uh, well, those little uh, pictographs uh, that represents the most important thing that happened in that particular year. So this is a, a series of winter counts, and you found this kind of sort of this sort of thing, uh, especially on the Great Plains. But there are that there are parallels to it across Indian peoples just about everywhere in North America. Ways of recording their history, their past. Uh, Brendan Ivy makes a good observation that this is uh, an uh, early version of emojis. 
<laughs> I, you know, I guess that's true. Hadn't thought of that way, but I will steal it if I can the next time I talk about this in, in, in classes. <laughs> so this was the revolution. Let me suggest to you, this revolution was happening roughly parallel to the one that we are familiar with in the East. Uh, like the one in the East, like the one in the East, uh, this one was had enormous implications, implications that were uh, economic, that were social, uh, that were political, that were cultural. It represents in many ways sort of the, bar the birth of new cultures. But this revolution, more than the one in the East, was essentially, essentially a revolution in, that was based in environmental change or environmental relationship. That is the relationship between human beings and the non-human environment around them. So I want you to think of this one as sort of ecologically or environmentally based. And when you think of it that way, then this revolution was really at literally at its base about this. This. Well, let me ask, let me ask you folks out there, what do you what do you see when you look at this slide? What is that? Let's give folks a minute to respond uh, to all of our participants. Again, use the chat box at the bottom of the control panel. What do you observe in this image? Rolling plains, Jeremiah says. Laura Wakefield, welcome uh, rolling swells of land. A prairie, says Jamie. Poppies, open space, horizon. <laughs> Chris notes that this is his desktop image, so it's finally oh. clean. Boat in plains, says Maria. Thanks, Wyndham. Open, Open sky. sky. <laughs> well, of course, they're all correct. It's all correct. But, uh, but let me suggest to you that this is really about this is the very foundation of this revolution and what it is. It's not the sky. It's not the plains. It's not the land itself. It's what all is on the land. That is, what you're looking at here is grass. Grass. So. One of the ways to think of this is the grass revolution. The grass revolution. And what I would like to do, hope to do this evening, is to uh, is to explain to you what that means, uh, and to through that ask you to think about not just this basic episode, this important episode, but think about also, also about how uh, one way of studying American history, all history, is to think of it in terms of human relationships with the environment around them, the human and the non-human, and the interaction between the two. That's what this really is, what is space. That's what this is, is about. <laughs> well, to go back to the beginning here, a few points, basic points to begin with. That is, first of all, when you, when you study American Indian history, Native American history, uh, a couple of things are, <laughs> have to be there, have to be established at the outset. First, it's a very old history, a very old history. Uh, American history. If 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 history is what people have done in a particular place, American history begins at least 12, thir 12 to 13,000 years ago. Some would say uh, earlier than that, 15,000 years ago, perhaps, with the arrival of the first peoples uh, in North America, in what is today the United States, from uh, from elsewhere, uh, coming over. It's it's a, it's debated exactly how and when that happens, but um, certainly uh, certainly primarily from uh, from far eastern Asia. Point number one. The point number two is diversity, variety. Uh, there are today uh, well more than 500 federally recognized native tribes in the United States. Uh, there were many more cultures than that before. Uh, many of them unfortunately have, have winked out since then. So antiquity and diversity are the points to begin with. But even Given this diversity, even given this diversity, uh, all of these peoples, for all of their differences, all of their different languages and cultures and cosmologies and life ways and appearances, dress, <laughs> architecture, for all of their differences, they were also all connected. Connected. What you see here, uh, this is a map uh, from the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, it's as far as the best as we can establish it uh, right now. This is a map of trade relations among native peoples uh, on the eve of European contact. So before the arrival of Columbus, 
uh, this was a network. Uh, this was the network of of, of, uh, of trades by which objects and people and ideas moved across the continent. Not showing you only the West here, but extends over over to the Atlantic coast as well, and it extends well southward down into Mexico and the Central America. If you look at those squares, those large squares, those are uh, those are the most important uh, permanent trading entrepôts, trading centers. A couple of them down there in the southwest, one along the Rio Grande. Um, another up, uh, a couple of others important ones up there on the uh, Missouri River, up to the north and the east. Now those large circles, those are large, uh, the most important and the largest uh, periodic trade meetings, rendezvous, uh, the one there quite right in the center, that's called the Shoshone Rendezvous. It was an annual gathering from different parts of the continent of people who met there and traded, uh, traded different items. So, uh, even given the diversity and the variety of Indian peoples, all of them were knit together by this, uh, this quite remarkable system of trade. What were they trading? What would you uh, see moving along these, these routes of trade? Well, all, all kinds of things. Uh, so a few, a very few examples here. Obsidian up there to the upper left, that's uh, sort of natural glass uh, when uh, lava uh, uh, cools very quickly, usually in water. It turns to this uh, natural glass, which is excellent uh, for making points and edges. Uh, flint, uh, right to the right of that is the Alley Bates Flint Quarry in the Texas Panhandle today near the city of Amarillo. Uh, this is, uh, archaeologists will tell us, this is the longest continually operating work site in, the, in all of uh, North America, making uh, quarrying flint, turquoise uh, from the Southwest. Over the lower right, mica, over there from Andes country, that's from the uh, Appalachians. Parrot feathers, macaw feathers from Central America. Conch shells from uh, the uh, Gulf Coast. There's been a grave uh, that was uh, excavated uh, on, up in the Dakotas. Uh, it was from about 200 AD, 200 AD, so more than 1800 years ago. Inside that grave, apparently a very important fellow, inside that grave were found a grizzly claws from the Rocky Mountains, were found mica from the Appalachians, they were found conch shells from the, uh, from the uh, Southwest, we found mussel shells uh, from the Gulf of California. All of these items buried with this man uh, coming from all across the continent. So, I want you to look at this map. I want you to think of goods, things, and people, and institutions, and ideas, and languages coursing through this system, moving through this, a very vigorous, uh, live uh, movement, of, movement of all of these things. Were there, it was going on. That had been going on for centuries, centuries before the coming of the Europeans. Then the Europeans show up. This is a map also from the Smithsonian. This is a map that uh, lays out as best as we can put it together uh, the routes of trade, the routes of trade that were uh, operating in, again, the American West uh, after the coming of Europeans. The Europeans, of course, were seeking goods of the Indians, furs in particular, but the Indians were also uh, speaking, uh, seeking goods of the Europeans. Much of what the Europeans brought uh, were highly desirable uh, to the Indians, and they sought them in this natural relationship of trade then began to develop. Now, what you look at when you put these two together, what's really striking is how the trade routes after the coming of Europeans um, basically just sort of follow those that were there before. So what you see here happening is this older trade system goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, was suddenly reinvigorated, reinvigorated with these new items brought in by the Europeans, with this new, this new coursing of trade. What was it? What was going across this new trade system? Well, we have some ideas, I did this by uh, the work of archaeologists. Here again is that map of trade routes uh, after the coming of Europeans, after the after contact. If we were to to zoom in on one of the major trading sites, it would be right there. Uh, this is up on the Missouri River. It's up near what's today Bismarck, North Dakota. 
It's the site of um, this village, the village of the Mandan and Tendatsa peoples up on the uh, up on the Missouri. They were a sedentary uh, agricultural tribe. You may know of these people because this was a village. Uh, this was a village that was visited in that first winter of the Lewis and Clark expedition, the winter of 1804 to 1805, and Lewis and Clark stayed with these stayed with these native peoples over the winter, learned a lot from them, and then struck off from these villages further up the Missouri River uh, on uh, on toward the on toward the Pacific. Well, archaeologists have worked in these villages uh, pretty aggressively, digging down to see what they what they could find there. And what they found was a lot. <laughs> what did they find? First of all, metal goods above all. Metal goods. Uh, you can see bracelets here, <laughs> gorgets, a uh, bell up top, other items. So one of the things that the Indians were especially attracted by uh, were these items of metallurgy that they had not had before. Uh, they would allow them to conduct their own way of life uh, even more efficiently than they had before. Get a sense of that here. See those two things down at the bottom, those sort of skinny, skinny little uh, things. <laughs> what are those? Anybody know? What's the uh, the letter of the object that you're referencing? Uh, well, let me get my glasses. Uh, uh, one, one, four, and five down there. Okay. I think the image might be inverse. That's okay. But one, four, and five. Uh, these have letters on them. Needles, Wyndham is guessing. Jamie is guessing alls. Alls, that's right. Alls. Yeah. A-W-L-S. Alls. Yes. I should say that I'm a Texan. Uh, it's very it's a word that's very difficult for me to say. Uh, because <laughs> Texans is all, all. He, he's talking about that black stuff that comes out of the ground uh, through wells and from the gasoline all well all well so these are all different kind of alls uh, an all was a a very thin piece of iron typically uh, that was used to to drill a hole in an animal skin doesn't sound like much of a deal to me but think of what think of what an indian woman would have to use for that in making clothing in constructing lodges teepees before without this what would that have been? Well, it would have been a bone. You have to take a bone. You have to you have to slice this bone down to a very thin piece. You have to whittle it down, whittle it down, to the point where it would uh, could be used uh, could be used to drill that hole. Well, how long did that take? How many times did you break off the thing before you uh, before you made one? How often would it break when you're using it? Now think of this. Of this, this metal, this what looks to us, this you know ridiculously simple metal object. Uh, it was a, it was it was a it was a miracle. It was something that would last virtually forever. It was something that made their lives far easier than they had been before. You said the same thing about pots, about uh, about um, something used as a sharpener to such a, a sharp uh, edge to, uh, to scrape the inside of a hide. So metal goods, metal goods. And when you look a little farther, fish hooks, but um, especially here, uh, weaponry, weaponry, those iron points, iron points, and of course those uh, gun parts, gun parts. Well, this was one of two basic categories, or I should say one of the two uh, most important uh, and most desirable trade items that Europeans brought with them. Metal goods generally, uh, but in particular, metal weaponry, things that made their their ability to hunt and their ability to fight uh, more effective, more effective. That was one. The second item, however, that brought brought by Europeans, uh, they've sought even more aggressively, even with even greater <laughs> enthusiasm. And this this was again a tool like these, but it was not metallurgy. It was horses. Horses. You can think of horse of a horse as a kind of a living tool. 
something that they would use to make their to pursue their traditional lives more easily uh, and to do uh, better and more efficiently what they had long done otherwise otherwise and even more than metal goods horses especially in the american west and especially in certain parts of the west like the great plains this became the great desideratum this became the great item that was most desired by indian peoples and the reason was as i suggested in the title of this uh of this uh session it was truly revolutionary revolutionary to understand that we've got to go back even farther much farther than before to look at how this how this came about and it starts with this guy hierarchitherium hierarchitherium this was the oldest living ancestor that we know of of the modern of the modern horse it's a mammal of course it's about the size of a, of a collie dog uh, it was around about 55 million years ago it originally came from the area around the great lakes but fairly early on hierarchitherium migrated westward and southward onto what will become the great plains onto the southern great plains and there over these millions of years hierarchitherium gradually evolved into the modern horse they can see him down there at the bottom and if you follow that lower that the yellow line you'll see how hierarchitherium evolved into various other forms first browse, browsers and then grazers if you follow the white lines you'll see how in this this classic sort of evolutionary bush how these other forms came about and they uh died out so you think of us this thing as, 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 as a bush in those white those white lines those white uh, uh names are ones that are pruned off the bush it's the yellow line that's important and that leads us up about a million years ago uh to the earliest form of the modern horse that you'll see there up the top left its formal name was equus equus cabayas and gradually over those millions of years then it appeared in its familiar form uh, today then then it um something happened about ten thousand years ago at the end of the last ice age what's called the wisconsin glaciation as the as the glaciers melted and as the climate changed dozens of species of animals uh, went extinct in what is today uh, the united states what is today north america and south america uh, it's called the great dying by some uh, by, by some uh, zoologists uh, you can think of many many examples so oh, the famous uh, smilodons or the um, saber-toothed tiger gone uh, great sloth uh, is gone. Uh, there's an American lion <laughs> gone. Uh, there was even there were there were, there were early uh, early armadillos, roughly the size of Volkswagen bugs, with a great spiked ball on their tail. Uh, gone. They're gone too. So dozens of species then sort of uh, disappeared, winked out at the end of the last ice age, and among them. Were horses horses that had been there are many different subspecies more horses that uh horses that were there in incredible profusion incredible profusion died out became extinct we're not sure exactly why all of this happened and there's debate about about that what we can say is that it did happen it did happen the horses became extinct in their birthplace in their cradle but by that time they had migrated as many animals had back and forth across that uh, that, that land of ex exposed spine of land beringia the bearing uh, the bearing land bridge that connects uh, connected to what's today alaska to siberia horses had moved out of the great plains up through the northwest up through what's today alaska across that on to into asia into asia and there they proliferated what you see here 
on this slide uh, is a map of, of grasslands, temperate grasslands, that is places that were especially amenable uh, to horses and other grazers. The two largest on earth by far are first in Central Asia, uh, the great steppes of Asia, by far the largest. But the second largest is over there in North America, the Great Plains and parts of the interior. They can see others down there, uh, the western coast of South America, Chile, over there in Argentina. But these were by far, by far the largest. So the horse, so Equus, Equus, Equus Cabayas, then uh, migrated across that land bridge. This was part of a, of a uh, heavily traveled highway, if you want to think of it that way. Bison, what we call the buffalo, the bison originated uh, in Asia. And they migrated in the other direction. It's like a great two lane highway. Bison migrated over into North America where they in turn proliferated. Uh, people, of course, made that migration as well. So the origins, uh, the uh, ancestors, ultimate ancestors of American Indians, both of them apparently came across that land bridge as well. But in this case, the horses came over they moved on to Central Asia. There they found this highly uh, uh, friendly environment with these huge grasslands. There they uh, developed, uh, there they uh, proliferated, there they evolved as they moved from there into other parts of the old world. Uh, they moved into, into Africa where they evolved into zebras. They moved uh, southeastward into China where they became the modern ass. So they took on different forms. As a Dan Flores, uh, the historian Dan Flores has put it, it said every one of the equids in, in the old world, that is horses and their, and their cousins, they are all, he said, American tourists uh, who, who forgot to go home. <laughs> so. Elliot, I'm, yeah. I'm curious, if you don't mind me asking this question, I, I'm curious, are you aware of the ways in which the horse was represented in art and memorial and even histories, I suppose, over time. I mean, has, has the horse always maintained that uh, that importance that you're describing? I think you know. I think it has. The earliest, of course, some of the earliest uh, depictions of other of animals uh, that we have uh, are those uh, famous cave paintings uh, right. in France and in Spain, and there are horses there. You know? So it's an interesting question. It's a good point. You know, what do we what do we choose? What do people choose uh, to illustrate? Uh, I think we have to assume that what they if they choose to paint a horse, the same way that they would choose, uh, you know, to to paint a ma uh, a mouth or a mastodon, uh, they're saying it's important. Important. But in some ways, it may also be the most invisible tool of these many thousands of years of growth yeah. and evolution. It's yeah. the thing we take for granted more than anything else. <laughs> I think I think so. Um, although I think it's also fair to say that um, for these peoples, you know, the, uh, for the for the greatest expanse of this time of these people's uh, acquaintance with horses, and this is true um, across the world, uh, uh, horses were considered uh, food. <laughs> you know, food. There was something you hunted hunted and ate in the same yeah. way that you would hunt a mammoth or a mastodon. It wasn't until quite quite a bit later that they began to take on that other sort of cultural meaning that we uh, that we know know them uh, as today. And that happened. Uh, that happened as far as we can tell uh, in what is today Ukraine. Mm. Ukraine. So as these horses were expanding and proliferating uh, and evolving in the old world, uh, about, as far as we can tell, about five to 7,000 years ago uh, in the Ukraine, or about there, something really, really important happened. <laughs> that is, they began to domesticate these animals. This is a period when they're also domesticating all kinds of other critters, uh, cattle, uh, goats, uh, sheep were being domesticated. And so they also domesticated uh, horses. And as I said, uh, it's, it's just as uh, I think the first relationship of people to horses was uh, that of a, a predator and prey, people would hunt them, kill them, and eat them. In the same way here, they were domesticated probably initially at the outset uh, as 
um, for the same for the same reasons uh, you domesticated cattle. That is, you would herd them, keep them around you, a sort of a available food, uh, milk them. Of course, milk is, is highly nutritious. And then, <laughs> and then somewhere around we think around five thousand, four to five thousand years ago, uh, there occurred what uh, I would I would argue is one of the great turning points in human history. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, Elliot, you just did something pretty intense. One of the greatest turning points in human history. Yeah. I hope everybody moves forward on their seat, including Raina's son, who has joined us. <laughs> this is a big build up. Yeah, yeah. Looking back on it, I think, uh, I think that's a, that point is incontestable. Because what happened was that somebody, we can imagine if you want to you know, sit around and imagine it, uh, somebody looked at these animals and thought, uh, what would happen if I got on top of one? What would happen if I got on top of that thing? What could I do that I couldn't, couldn't do before? So about four to 5,000 years ago, people began to, after they had domesticated the horse, they began to turn the horse to these other purposes. And those other purposes uh, depended upon them riding the horses. Riding the horse. You know, if you can think of it, if you get on top of a cow, not much you can do with it. <laughs> uh, top of a, of, a, of a goat, even less. But a horse, boy, with a horse. Think of all that you can do. Once you can uh, not just have that animal at your command, at your command as food, but to have that animal at your command as power, as power. So people on horseback, on horseback, what could they do more that they couldn't do before? Uh, well, they could travel much farther and much faster than they had before. They could hunt far more efficiently. Than they had before. They could uh, trade far more extensively than they had before. And by hunting, they could also they have more things to trade with, and so they could become more prosperous. But uh, pretty quickly, apparently, they discovered that there was other, one other thing that they could do that they could do that uh, would uh, allow the, that they could that would change. Their, change their uh, their their way of life forever, and that is they could fight. They could wage war far more effectively. A person on horseback, a person on horseback, uh, is a formidable weapon. And so what they did once they began to realize that other potential of a horse being on a horse, they began to expand. They begin to make war more effectively on the people around them. So uh, just about every example of one of these horse people that I can think of becomes at some point, usually sooner than later, sort of imperialistic, expansionist, expanding their power, conquering other peoples. So what we're talking about here uh, is a, the emergence of a horse culture. And I use that term in the uh, in the title uh, of my presentation. Horse. What do I mean by that? What is a horse culture? A horse culture. Using culture here in the anthropological sense. A horse culture is a way of life in which horses are absolutely essential. It's a way of life, a culture uh, that cannot be what it is without horses. Uh, so you can think of it. Think of it today. How, how would you describe us? <laughs> what kind of a culture are we? Uh, well, I think we're a, we're a car culture. We're a culture based around the internal combustion engine. You cannot begin to imagine how our society today can operate without cars and trucks. Uh, we are increasingly, as we're demonstrating right now, a, a cyber culture. A, a culture that, uh, that that's dependent upon these sorts of uh, connections that uh, bind us together. Well, think of it that way. In the same way that we are a car culture and a cyber culture, these were this was a horse culture, a horse culture. 
then a horse culture at some point almost invariably becomes expansionist. So this first horse culture in what's today the um, the horse in what is today Ukraine begins to expand. See at first uh, those Asian steps, some Asian steps, a series of, of, of powerful, aggressive, warlike horseback people, the Mongols, for example. They expand to the east, into uh, into Europe, Poland first. The Poles become the first European horse people, horse culture. To the south, in the Middle East, in the Fertile Crescent. So the rise of what we think of the rise of these early civilizations depended first, at first, uh, in part, upon the domestication and the use of horses. From there, they expanded to the west, into North Africa, into North Africa, the famous you know, Ar Arabian uh, peoples, cultures there. Then, in turn, of course, uh, in the in uh, as we uh, get into the Christian era, uh, in turn, they expand. In this case, expanding, uh, bearing the religion of uh, Islam up to the north, into Iberia, into Spain, and it was in it was in Spain, in the Iberian Peninsula, that we see the coming together of two of these strains of horse cultures, militaristic peoples, one out of Europe, down into Iberia, the other out of North Africa, up into Iberia. And there they sort of combine and blend and evolve and become one of the great military powers of, uh, of modern history. And then, of course, in 1492, that uh, that Iberian horse culture, the same year that it expels the expels uh, the um, uh, Islam's uh, Islam from the peninsula, makes its jump over into the Western Hemisphere, and so horse cultures then expand out of Europe, from Asia into or into Europe, out of Europe into the Americas. And it is the use of the horse uh, that, along with others, other elements that allowed the Spanish then to establish their empire in the West Indies and then in central Mexico. And then in the 1540s, in the 1540s, seeking more uh, areas to conquest, this horse culture expands out of Mexico to the north under this band. Francisco uh, uh, Coronado up into the Southwest, and then in a branching movement over through Western Texas, up into Kansas. And with that, with Coronado's Entrada up into up into the Southern Great Plains, in effect then, uh, the horse has come home. It took about a million years, but Equus, Equus Caballas, after evolving on the southern Great Plains, migrates up through North America, up through Alaska, over Beringia, over into Europe, and then down into China, down over into Africa, down into Africa, over into Europe, uh, into Africa, North Africa, up into Spain, across the Atlantic, into Mexico, back up into, back up into the plains. It was about a million year uh, circumnavigation of the globe. About a story uh, in itself. But what I want you to do uh, as you look at this picture is to think a little bit about what, what you're actually looking at. What are you seeing? Because a horse returned to its birthplace uh, in a sense, in the same, in the same uh, form that it was, it was still Equus, Equus Cabayas. But this was in a sense, a different creature. A different creature altogether. What I want you to do is to look at this picture and to think of that man on that horse as one animal, as one animal, because the horse returned in partnership with human beings, returned in a symbiotic relationship with people. That's a different animal altogether. Andy, you mentioned a moment ago about how, how has a horse been depicted uh, 
over time uh, artistically. Uh, we're all familiar, I think, uh, with the, uh, the Greek uh, mythic figure, um, the centaur. The centaur. Think of this as a, as a centaur. It is the, an animal with the body of a horse with the upper torso of a human man. That's a really interesting way to, to look at that, Elliot, and it also makes me rethink seeing uh, even more contemporary memorials in which many of the key human figures are on horseback, but again, my eye doesn't always go to the horse. It's a little bit of an afterthought. It's a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a vessel more than an extension, but you're absolutely right in uh, drawing those together. Yeah, yeah. It's a, and, and, you know, ask yourself, uh, where did this image come from, the centaur? You know, who? Who would have thought? What, what were they thinking of when they saw that? I think, there's no way to prove it, I think that that goes back to when those first people, in this case, down in Southern Europe, you know, down by the Aegean, when they felt the first impact of those horse horseback empires to their north and to their east coming down on them, <laughs> sweeping, sweeping everything before them. You know, um, the centaur is supposed to be a scary thing. And it was, just as those first people on horseback coming down and conquering them, slaughtering them, must have been the same thing, the same thing. Uh, John Slavin then offers maybe a, a third extension, which is an interesting one to get, to anticipate, which is the addition of the of, of a gun, of the weapon. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, and think of it that way. In the sense, in the same sense that uh, Indians sought the gun as a trading as a trade good they were seeking the horse they would seek the horse for many of the same reasons the great advantage was of course uh the guns do not reproduce themselves <laughs> horses do horses right. do uh jamie's also wondering if in this image that you're sharing currently um was the horse getting a blessing here oh i see i doubt that uh, what you see here is a franciscan uh, father, a Franciscan monk. What this is a highly idealized and rather romanticized image of the coming of the Spanish and Europeans, uh, the Spanish uh, uh, on into into North America, uh, and it was as always the conquistador, of course, um, Coronado, and uh, the coming of the of the Catholic Church. In any case, so think of this then. Well, you know, after all, what is what is the Spanish word? What's the Spanish word for gentleman? Here's a test of our Spanish-speaking audience. What's the Spanish <laughs> word for gentleman? Gentleman. First in gets uh, dinner with Elliot in Fayetteville, Arkansas, John Slavin, <laughs> Gabrielio. Caballero. Caballero. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The word John's itself. For dinner in Fayetteville. <laughs> <laughs> the word itself has an interesting history. It goes back to when uh, just feudalism. Uh, Caballero, uh, those were the upper class uh, Spanish. Uh, gentlemen, and they were uh, they were upper class because they were the most powerful. They were most powerful because they had horses. Uh, but I want you to take that word quite literally. If you translate translate that word from the Spanish to the English literally, it is horseman. Horseman, not horseman in the sense that we usually use it. A horseman that we usually we think of using, we think of that word as a horseman is someone is a is a man who is sitting on top of a horse. I want you to take that word horseman, and I want you to divide it into two, and put a hyphen between them. A horse hyphen man. That's what that is. It's a blend. It's, it's a, a a marriage of people and horses. That was the basis of this revolution. Because what is that after all? What is a caballero? What is a horse man? A horse man, and that's what you're looking at here. A horse man is an animal, a single animal, with the body of a horse which is to say the power of a horse and the speed of a horse, the grace of a horse. Is there anything more beautiful than a running horse? And with the brain of a human being, a, a human brain, which is to say a human intelligence, human imagination, human arrogance, <laughs> human dreaming, so what the horse man did was to, what the horse man was, was this new animal that had everything that people have that sets people apart. 
married uh, to the strength and the power and the speed of a horse. That was a revolution. That was a revolution. That is what then led to this expansion uh, of horse cultures across the world. And to get back to your, your point earlier, Andy, that's what makes this one of the most important turning points in human history. Because human history, in a way, after that, <laughs> you can argue, you know, you can suggest. It's just a history of how these horse cultures expanded and played themselves out. Well, how did it happen here? They came back home, as I said, with the Spanish in the 1540s, the Spanish return uh, to um, New Mexico uh, to, uh, to establish permanent settlements there at the very end of the 1500s, 1598. Uh, they come with horses. Horses are absolutely essential for them to keep their power there. But the Spanish understood, they were no fools. The Spanish understood that uh, horses were power, were power. And so it was, just, it was important to keep those horses to themselves as much as possible, and to keep them out of the hands of Indian people. So if they were going to dominate the Indians, they couldn't let the Indians have them. Well, some of the Indians around them acquired them, of course. There was some leakage out of, uh, <laughs> out of New Mexico. But still, the concentration of horses remain there in New Mexico. See down there at the bottom of the map, down by about Taos, down there. Uh, uh, from the coming of the coming of the Spanish at the very late 1500s, nearly a hundred years, up until 1680. Now, if you know uh, your your history of the Southwest, you know that that's an important year, 1680, because in 1680, uh, the Pueblo Indian peoples uh, rose up against their Spanish colonizers and drove them out, drove the Spanish southward uh, down the uh, journey of death of Bernardo de Muerto down to El Paso. And for 12 years, 1680 to 1692, uh, the Spanish were, were, were kept out of New Mexico. Indian peoples there, the Pueblos, had, had that area entirely to themselves. Starting in 1680, then, horses began to move very rapidly through trade and conquest out of New Mexico, out of the Southwest, up through the American West. And what you see in this map are these dates in which horses expand, and more explicitly, horse cultures begin to appear. Look how fast it is. Two points, two points here. First, how rapid this was. Look up there at the Shoshones, 1700, 20 years later, 20 years later, the Shoshones are converting to this new way of life. Uh, another 30 years, the Nez Perce people all the way up there in Oregon and Idaho, they have a horse culture. Over there on the plains, 1720, the Pawnees, the Comanches even before that. <clears throat> up into the Northern Plains, 1740, 1750, 1770. So by uh, the date that anthropologists use, by around 1780, horse cultures have spread throughout the West and have established themselves everywhere that they would eventually establish themselves. What everywhere? But by 1780, 100 years after the Taos uprising, the Pope insurrection, and within 100 years, that's you know that's that's nothing. Uh, horse cultures then have exploded across the West, all the way up, all the way up into Canada. So that's the first point to make, how fast this happens. The second point is, uh, look at these years. <laughs> what years are we talking about? Especially those latter ones, 1740, uh, 1750, 1770, 1770. What's going on? <laughs> what is happening elsewhere in North America? Those, of course. So, Elliot, I have to chime in here and say that this this is what sort of explodes my East Coast uh, perspective, which which is, I, and I don't know that it's a sinister uh, occurrence necessarily, but you know, coming with an East Coast perspective, everything else is just waiting in repose for us to activate the page <laughs> in the in the history book, right? Everything's happening on the East Coast. So you're now telling me that there's actually these really significant things happening on the west in the west as well oh boy and of course that's that's a point i try to make at the outset uh, how how much our perspective on the full american history uh, can change if we simply pull back you know and look uh, with a wide angle lens pull back and look at the whole story and, and, and let the indians in. <laughs> look how it's happening here yeah exactly andy thank you for thank you for the point because and and, and look again look at these years what is happening <laughs> 
what is happening in 1770, in 1750? What's happening, of course, in the East Coast is the other American Revolution. When does this come into, what is, when does this come into focus? Like I said, what year do we use to say the, this is the year in which horse cultures in the West have, have pretty much um, you know, found their place? 1780, squarely in the middle of the Revolutionary War. <laughs> Six years after it began, or five, actually five years after it began, uh, three years, uh, two years uh, before it was before it was finished. So this was the other American Revolution, the coming of this horse culture, a story that itself, of course, goes back uh, thousands of years, thousands of years, but a story that is now kind of kind of coming to its culmination here in the West at the same time that that other American Revolution uh, was transpiring, was unfolding, unfolding in the East. Uh, I've got just a quick question for you um, before we move on. Wyndham Why Not asks, uh, did any of the Eastern Indian cultures adopt to the horse culture later? Uh, they did. In fact, they had already adopt, uh, adopted it uh, earlier than that. Uh, Eastern Indian peoples uh, took to the horse, but, but not to the same degree that they did here in the West. Some of them came pretty close. If I don't know if any of you uh, folks out there are from Florida. Uh, but if not, uh, even, even if not, uh, you're aware of the Seminole Indians in Florida. Uh, the Seminoles uh, were great uh, horsemen, and there were horse, uh, there were horse uh, uh, Indians uh, raising horses uh, throughout the Gulf Coastal area. But the point to emphasize here, uh, getting back in fact to Andy's uh, first point, first question to me about where is the West, the point to emphasize here um, is that horse cultures evolve on grasslands in horse cultures and consequently horses are most are, are most uh, uh, familiar with grasslands and horse cultures are most effective on grasslands and in those sorts of environments that you find in the American West. So you you did not find in the East while Indian peoples in the East had horses, you didn't see them fully converting to this entirely new way of life the way you did the way you did uh, uh, in the West. Does that get your question? I think it did, thank you. Okay. Okay, so what does that do? What does that do? Well, uh, among other things, this made the much of the West, uh, uh, the West generally, but especially that part in the middle, uh, that great grassland, suddenly one of the most desirable places to live in, in, in the entire continent of North America. The Great Plains before had been a pretty tough way to make it. Uh, hard to live there. Uh, most people tried to uh, almost stay on the fringes of it and the rivers and the fringes. Um, but with the horse suddenly, or, or exactly here, the horse man with the horse culture, suddenly, suddenly, uh, the Great Plains, these grasslands were highly desirable, highly desirable. So what you see is this rapid migration of peoples. Just about every Indian group that you can think of that we associate with the Great Plains, we tend to think of them as going back <clears throat> for, you know, for time and memorial. No, almost every one of them came onto the Plains during the period that we're looking at right now. They came onto the Plains uh, 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 with the spread of the horse cultures there, the Comanches of the Southern Plains. Uh, the Sioux, Western Sioux, or the Lakota on the Northern Plains, the Cheyennes of the uh, the Cheyennes of the Central Plains, the Arapahoes of the of the Central Plains, the Kiowas of the Southern Plains, uh, of, the, of the Northern and then the Southern Plains, uh, the Crows, the Assiniboines, the Blackfeet. All those Indian peoples are relatively recent arrivals on the plains. Why? Why did they go there? <laughs> they went there because of horses. A pursuit of this new way of life, of this new this way, new way of life. Well, what's what is really going on here? Well, they develop this who whole new way of life. They are able to, of course, to travel much farther, to trade much more effectively. Uh, they are able to hunt far more effectively, especially the bison, the bison, of course, who are also indigenous. Who, I mean, who are also, of course, proliferating across the plains, and they are also able to fight better. To fight better, so it becomes this this revolution in e economic revolution, 
it becomes a, a military revolution. It becomes a diplomatic revolution. But as much as anything, let me suggest to you that this was a revolution of, uh, of what? The spirit, I think. Uh, the great American Indian author, Scott Mamaday, uh, wonderful writer, wonderful man. Uh, he's Kiowa, part Kiowa, part Cherokee. The Kiowas uh, originated in, in the Northern Rockies. They, used, they moved onto the plains and southward to become allies of the Comanches. And as they moved southward, gradually southward, at some point they adopted the horse. They became a horse people. And Mamaday, uh, talking about this, uh, writing about this uh, in one of his essays, says, we became, talking about the Kiowas, we became, he said, uh, centaurs of the spirit. Centaurs of the spirit. A great phrase. So it becomes a sense of empowerment. What must that have felt like? Uh, it must have been like you, you could do anything. You could do anything. You could suddenly you were overcoming space itself, <laughs> becoming a new, a new way of life, a new people, literally, sort of a new being. A new being. There's this story I love to I love to uh, to read to my students of a of a group of a uh, sort of like this scene here. These, uh, these white Europeans coming out on the plains and greeting, uh, being greeted by this uh, leader who, uh, who comes out of his village. Um, he's naked on the back of a, of a horse and he comes up uh, singing a great song, uh, riding at a gallop and he gets off his horse and invites them down and invites one of them to, to step upon his horse, to sit upon the horse, to lead them back into the village. And the horse, uh, they said, was uh, decorated gaudily his head was painted uh, in ochre and red, uh, and he was uh, his mane uh, was full of uh, full of ribbons. It smelled nice. Uh, the man had uh, chewed up uh, different plants to to spit, spit upon the horse to make it smell smell <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was a sense of uh, this is who I am. Yeah, this is who I am, and I'm a powerful man, and I'm powerful because of this. My partner, this is my partner. So this was this revolution of the spirit, but beneath it, to get back to our point, was this grass. What, what did this really represent? What did this really represent? As I showed you before, the horse evolved on one great grassland, it migrated to another great grassland where it proliferated and, and evolved further, and then it returned to this grassland. It's grass. That is the key. That is the key. Why? What are we talking about? You need to get back to biology. <laughs> Something that you might re recall, recall uh, from your uh, from your courses in biology. Something called the energy pyramid. Begin with this point. Uh, all energy, basically all energy, all power comes initially from the sun. The sun. Uh, everything <laughs> we eat is basically sunlight converted into something else. Everything organic around us is basically sunlight. So when you're eating a, a hamburger, you're eating sunshine. <laughs> when you're petting your dog, you're petting sunlight. Everything starts with the sun, but we can only use it after it has been turned into something else. And that starts, of course, with plants. They're at the bottom. Plants through photosynthesis. Uh, turn sunlight, turn sunlight into uh, food, into into organic material. Right? Everything starts with that. And then there are those who can eat the plants and to take its energy. Those are uh, herbivores. We, of course, are partially herbivores. So we can eat plants and gain something from them at the same same way we eat meat, carnivores. How we can ever, however, cannot really eat grass, at least the kind of grass we're talking about. We can eat grass seed, corn is grass seed, but we can't get out on all fours and eat the grass in our lawns and get anything out of it. We have to wait and others have to wait until something else eats the grass, herbivores eat the grass and turn it into to themselves and then we can eat them. But here's the problem, here's the problem. Grass uses 90% of its energy just to be grass, to do what grass does, which means that only 10% of 
of that energy is left for the herbivore to gain to turn it into what it does. And the herbivore in turn uses 90% of its energy, solar energy, uh, to be a bison, to be a cow, to be a deer, to be an elk. So it leaves only 10% uh, from of what it has for something, a carnivore, to eat it. So uh, it works like this. It's the energy pyramid. If X is the energy of the sun, the energy acquired by grass from the sun is about 10%. It's probably much, much lower than that, but in any case. So when bison eat the grass, um, they're eating only 1% of the original energy of the sun. When people eat bison, they're down to a tenth of a percent. If you're starting with 100% the energy of the sun. It's 10%, 10%, then 1%, then 0.1% of that original energy acquired by people eating the bison or eating a cow. And if you want to take it a step farther, when grizzly bears eat people, they're getting 0.01% uh, of the energy. So, you know, when we think of, uh, we think of the uh, pyramids, we often th think of sort of uh, people at the top of the, of, the, of the pecking order, top of the, uh, of the eating order. Uh, so we think of grizzlies, you know, at the top of the, of the food chain, uh, people at the top, and then others below them. But they're also, they're also at the at the lower end of the energy that's available. They're acquiring. Therefore, there are a lot more people in grizzly bears because there are more energy available for people. There are a lot more bison than people. A lot more grass than bison. Right? Okay. So what happens when a man becomes a horse? man. What happens when you blend those two together? What happens then when you have this animal that has the body of a horse and the brain of a human? In effect, what people are doing is taking one step down the energy pyramid because now they can draw directly upon the energy of the grass the same way, uh, same way that a cow does, that a bison does except now they can use that energy for human purposes. So that's what I call the great, the, the big energy jump. Again, if X is the energy of the sun and people eating bison to get, uh, to, get to that energy or, or what, 0.1%, what happens when it's a, it's a horse man? 1%. What happens then is, that people take one step down the energy pyramid and they suddenly have access to 10 times the energy that they had before. That is what happens with the horse revolution. That is why I call it the grass revolution. One way to think of it. That energy jump is what created those first horse cultures and made them so powerful, made them so wealthy. That then is what gave all of the others the power that they had <laughs> because they were, they were literally sucking sunlight 10 times uh, at the rate on the scope that they did before. And that was everything. That was everything. So what happens with Indian peoples? Well, this is a, a drawing of, um, of what Coronado found. What Coronado found um, on the Great Plains. These are people that they call Carechos, uh, nomadic peoples. Uh, and you can see it looks familiar to us because it looks like these teepees. But, but first of all, look at the number of teepees. <laughs> you know, just a handful of them, four in this case. Uh, and you can see they're, they're hunting bison because there's that bison skull there. They do have domesticated dogs back there. And you can see back in the far back that that is um, bison meat that they're drying. So in that sense, it's familiar, but look at the scale of it. If this, if this, if this woman here stood up, bump her head inside that, that teepee, that lodge. Tiny, they're like little pup tents, right? What happens with the horse culture? What happens 
with the grass revolution. This is what happens. This is what happens. So many more lodges, so many more people. They're still living in lodges. They're still uh, hunting bison back there in the distance. But look at the size of what they have, how many of them there are. This is, this is the revolution. A revolution in, among other things, in power and in uh, affluence. They're wealthy compared to what they were before. Here's a painting of a, of a Blackfoot encampment. Look at the size of those things, of those lodges. Enormous. They're like McMansions. Why? Well, first of all, because they could kill enough bison to build them. Uh, they also could um, trade far more effectively to get the things that they wanted. Uh, they, if you look inside these teepees, look inside these lodges, what would you find? You, know, you would find all kinds of trade goods uh, from across the nation and to an extent across the world. You, you might find carpets made in New England uh, textile mills. You might find coffee grinders produced in the East. And coffee, <laughs> Uh, coffee uh, th uh, that was from uh, South America in the Indies. Uh, you would find people flavoring that coffee with molasses from New Orleans. You would find some of these teepees lined with bed ticking from New England. Uh, from New England, uh, the great Kaiwa warrior, uh, Satanta. Satanta. There's a story I love about him where uh, he lived in a place like this, uh, and he um, he had carpet on his uh, on his the floor of his lodge. And when it was, if he had guests, when it was time to uh, to summon the guests for dinner, he would step outside of his lodge, and he would summon his guests by blowing on a French horn. <laughs> so this was a, a revolutionized way of life, and it comes from horses, and it really comes from grass, and new access, new access to the sun. Quite a change. So that then explains then suddenly why this uh, why this um, sudden movement of people, great migration onto the plains, uh, takes place very rapidly, and again basically coincident with the other revolution going on uh, in the East. This was the other American Revolution, and. It was, I think, one of the great stories of American history. One that we, uh, I think, um, oh, that we need to pay more attention to, to allow into our classes. Let me end, this, end the presentation here on uh, what is rather grim, I suppose, but also a, um, a very contemporary note by introducing another historical player here into the story. This. What's this? You might know what this is. Let's take a quick guess. No Google searching, please. Uh, Jimmy Beck, thank Got you. It. <laughs> Smallpox, variola major virus, another virus. Not, not the one today, thank God. This was, uh, along with uh, tuberculosis and malaria, this was one of the three great killers of human history. And it was introduced into the New World uh, quite early in the Spanish conquest, we think perhaps with the Cortes in Mexico. It was rampant throughout much of the New World. And it, of course, was uh, play a major role in the European conquest and domination of European peoples, of, of Indian peoples, uh, along with other, other uh, diseases uh, brought by Europeans into, uh, into the New World. It's a horrific horrifying disease. There's a man about to die of it. Uh, your body is covered with these blisters. These blisters burst uh, and you're basically flayed. That you lose your skin. If you haven't died already from shock and from fever, uh, you die from the invasion of your body, massive invasion of other, of other infections. Horrifying. Horrifying. Well, as I said, smallpox, uh, spread throughout much of the New World. It was devastating to Indian peoples uh, throughout North America, throughout uh, the Western Hemisphere, but not entirely. 
there were parts of the Western Hemisphere, were parts of North America that did not experience smallpox until much later, until much later. And that included most of the American West. As far as we can tell, most of the American West avoided smallpox entirely until late in the 18th century. Late in the 18th century. We're back to this history book, uh, this uh, winter count. If we were to zero in on this particular winter count, we would find this is one of them. Smallpox hews them up winter. The biggest event of this particular year was the coming of smallpox to these people. This is on the northern plains. You see the man here who is covered with those sores, those blisters. Uh, that squiggly thing above his head stands for pain, agony, agony. He is dying in agony from this disease. But look at the date, 1779 to 1780. A couple things are obvious about that date. First of all, uh, it's quite late. Uh, smallpox had been had attacked in the East decades before that, many decades, many generations before that. It, is, it had hit in the Southwest coming up out of Mexico into, this, into New Mexico and Arizona to Texas, decades before this. Only in 1779 to 1780 did it come to the Northern Plains and the Pacific Northwest. Why? <laughs> what was different around 1780? Anybody want to guess? What made the difference? See if we have some guesses in the audience. What made the difference? Why is this in 1780? Well, you should know. Remember the date now. Remember the date. What date should we associate 1780 with? Well, that, sure. It's 1780, remember. 1780, this is the date that uh, anthropologists use for the seating, the, 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 the sure seating of horse cultures. The difference was the horse. The difference was the horse. How had they, how had they avoided smallpox before? Well, smallpox is transmitted uh, for about 10 days from the time a person begins to show symptoms of it until that person either dies or survives and cannot, uh, and cannot uh, pass it along. That means that uh, there has to be contact between uh, con uh, contaminated people and new hosts, new groups, before that virus can spread. What we're talking about here, we use a modern <laughs> term today, is social distancing. Social distancing. Before 1780, because people were, were moving on foot, on foot, by the time they got to new populations, uh, they could no longer pass it along. And so smallpox could not spread out of the Southwest, spread out of the East, because people didn't move fast enough. Because the reality, because they weren't trying to do it, of course, but the, the fact is that they, that they were social distancing. It wasn't until 1780 that suddenly, they can move fast enough. They can move fast enough in order to reach contaminated people, could reach new groups and to pass that, pass the virus along. The same way, the same way that in our modern society today, uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, can move from China to California, to Washington, to Chicago, to New York City, uh, to um, Philadelphia and to Fayetteville, Arkansas. We have it here, we have it here, because people can move fast enough to pass it along before the people who are infected, who are sick with it, um, either die or um, survive and cannot pass it along. What the horse did then was to break down that social distancing, and allow the, allow the contagion, allow the virus to move on its course. Now here, You'll remember this map is the one that shows the trade routes after the coming of Europeans. This is part of an important part of that trade route, that Shoshone Comanche trade. 
a main route of, um, of movement. This shows the passage of smallpox during those years. Out of the southeast, out of the southwest, up through the, uh, up through that uh, Comanche, Shoshone Comanche uh, trade route, up onto the northern plains, where it explodes with horrific, horrific effect. So you can see, it's just following the trade, and the trade, of course, is being conducted with horses. Again, the parallel to the other revolution in the East. Uh, the smallpox epidemic was very important in the course of the American Revolutionary War. It helped Washington at, um, in, in, his, uh, in his campaigns. Uh, it was important in his victory at Yorktown. The deaths there were not inconsiderable. But look in the West. In Boston, 287 people died. Among the Comanches, 4,000. The Crows, 3,400. On the Northern Plains, 10,000. In the Northwest, 25,000 died. How does it happen? It happens because suddenly, suddenly, Western Indians are connected. They're connected because of the horse. So this revolution that allows him so much, so much power, so much power, uh, has this awful corresponding effect. The bad news with the good news. Well, I'll leave it with that. Uh, we're at 7.30, I think. Um, it's an important story, I think. It's a story that tells us a lot about American history when we look at it as broadly as we can. It's a story that uh, I think helps us appreciate uh, what's going on across the continent during these years that we tend to associate with the usual narrative focused in the East. Two more points, two final points uh, to make about it, about this particular story. Number one, it happens where it all began. It began, in a sense, 55 million years ago with Hierarchitherium, uh, and it happened here, and that was where it happened. Uh, that is where this revolution takes place. So this, this particular aspect of the horse revolution, the grass revolutions, take place where it started. And secondly, it was the last time it ever happened. This was the last horse culture, the last time that people made that breakthrough, the last time that people uh, totally revolutionized their lives by getting on the backs of, of this animal, of horses, and becoming horse men, horse people. It makes it, I think, one of the most important, uh, certainly to me, one of the most interesting and intriguing uh, stories in all of American history. That's all I got. Yeah. Elliot, I want to thank you. And I, you know, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately, but I do have one final question for you. Um, I also sure. want to point out that uh, Raina's son, 14-year-old son, is uh, was an active participant tonight. But I do have one question tonight, and that is, sure. um, you know, we, we've sort of offered, you've offered now this alternative, that's the wrong word, it's not alternative, it's just a second uh, parallel revolution that's happening uh, temporally at the same time as the American narrative that we all tell that's a part of all of our U.S. textbooks, U.S. history textbooks, it's it's got the, the figures and the events that we're all sort of a part of our culture of literacy. Right. Um, but it seems like offering them as two parallel plays doesn't really do it service either. Are you aware of any intersecting points, any Venn diagram where these two things can be shared together for some of the teachers we have tonight? Uh, you mentioned smallpox, that's an interesting place, but where else do these stories intersect so they can be told simultaneously? Yeah, I think they intersect, they certainly intersect in the end. Uh, I guess I could have made a third point uh, at the end, and that is this one ends tragically, uh, because what you see in this period, at the, at the time that, the, that these two revolutions are occurring, one of them represents the end of a global era, uh, the end of this period uh, of dominated by horse cultures. The other represents the beginning of the new one, the beginning of a new era in which we begin to, uh, begin to, uh, to acquire energy 
uh, to access energy and to use energy in entirely new ways that are far more powerful than the one before. And this is, of course, the industrial revolution, uh, the application of new kinds of sunlight, in this case, fossil fuels, uh, uh, to new technologies, new ways of, uh, of using the world, new ways of exploiting the environment, new ways of, of exercising power, including military. So if you right. follow the story forward, uh, then what you see is this, this last horse culture uh, that arose where it all began, is beaten, of course, is, is crushed within 100 years, is crushed uh, by this second revolution, the other revolution, and its, in turn, its new uh, environmental uh, regime, the regime right. of, of the modern world uh, that is the, through railroads and the telegraph and the rest of it that, that defeats the Indians. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And it, it occurs to me, too, that there, for our teachers who are thinking about ways to share these dual stories, dual narratives, one of which is very traditional and very accepted, the other which may surprise many as they consider it, uh, is the linguistics behind it. Um, I, I'm, I recall uh, working with Fred Anderson, historian at University of Colorado uh -huh. in Boulder, who described that moment, and I think, he, I think he has a document in the 1830s in which we stopped referring to the back country, meaning our backs were to the west and we are still pointing to the yeah. UK, to England, yeah. and instead started using the term frontier because yeah. we turned our attention to the West Coast. Um, and maybe there's, a, there's a moment where Americans start to imagine what's there. Yeah, I think that's, exa I think that's exactly right. And what you see during this period uh, are, of course, uh, a transition. Uh, the American military is using horses as well, but increasingly, increasingly, they turn to other ways, What you see among other ways in the Civil War. You know, is this sort of a passage? Civil war is this transition uh, between these two sources of power: uh, men on horseback and artillery, <laughs> men on horseback well, and railroads. Yeah, Elliot, I could talk to you all night. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to have to uh, end the conversation, unfortunately, but I would encourage all of our participants to access this recording and to continue uh, exploring these dual narratives. Elliot, thank you so much. You're quite welcome. You all stay safe. Yeah, thank you. I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us tonight. Uh, please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media feeds, as well as signing up for our email blast. Uh, that'll give you access to all of our upcoming opportunities and any adjustments we might be making. Um, I hope to see each of you at our next uh, webinar uh, scheduled for April 16th, next week. We'll be uh, working with Jefferson Cowley from Vanderbilt University on a session titled The Politics and Culture of Inequality since the 1970s. Um, in a moment, I'm going to open the post-webinar survey. Please do complete it, and then uh, you'll have access to your certificate for attending. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Please be well. Um, let us know how we can help. I'll see you next time on the National Humanities Center uh, Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. Good night.